Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Uh, One of the names really in the news today for not the good reasons is Super Micro Computer. It's ordered to resign. That's not good. The stock's off 30% on that news. Let's break down what's going on over there because this was a high-flying AI-type stock that peaked at about $180 right. a share back a- in March. Yeah, it added to the S&P 500 back right. in March. Yeah. Right, so right at the all-time high, but boy, down at $34 a share right now. Wu Jin Ho joins us. He's a senior technology analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. He's down in our Princeton, New Jersey office. Wu Jin, what happened today over at Super Microcomputer? Yeah, so um, thanks, Paul. Uh, look, there's been some filing delays at Supermicro, uh, some uh, differences of opinion in terms of the auditor and the management team, and essentially the, uh, the auditor resigned uh, due to quote-unquote integrity issues uh, uh, with the management team there. And, and this isn't like Joe's CPAs. This is Ernst right, Young this is a big deal. Re- resigning, and this does not happen often at all. So wh- what's Ernst and Young saying about why they resigned? Well, um, you know, in, in the AK filing, essentially, Ernst & Young is saying that uh, there were some differences of opinion and uh, they didn't think that uh, there was enough transparency from the Auditor Committee um, a- as well as uh, uh, integrity issues uh, from the Auditor uh, Committee. Um, so, so, look, quite, quite frankly, it's the first time uh, I've ever seen language like that. And the other thing that I can state is, is that, you know, Ernst & Young is the second auditor that uh, Supermicro had in the span of 18 months. So they were supposed to clean up the issues from the prior auditor. And uh, it sounds like they found issues that, that just couldn't be uh, resolved. And of course, the resignation comes uh, after news broke last month that the DOJ had launched a probe into an ex-employee's claims that Supermicro actually violated accounting rules. What do we know so far about how many different issues there are kind of more broadly when it comes to this company? Yeah, so, so um, not, m- not much news has come out of the DOJ uh, probe, uh, but it is uh, bringing up some uh, older issues uh, that caused their delisting uh, roughly uh, three to four years back. Uh, essentially, they were very aggressive on their accounting side, and it seems as if, uh, based on a short report that came out in July, uh, it, it seems as if uh, they went back to their old ways um, uh, in, in the recent months and recent quarters. Woods, just as an you know an outside observer here, I see a story like this, and I say I need change at the board level, and I need change in the C-suite level. Are you hearing calls from some of their shareholders for for some types of moves like that? Well, uh, that's the that's how we titled our our, our React, React report. It's like, look, Supermicro needs uh, more than an auditor change to fix this. Um, and uh, we were concerned about their corporate governance. Uh, if, if you keep in mind that. Uh, uh, there aren't many independent board members, uh, one of whom includes uh, the wife of the CEO. Um, there really needs to be a, a lot more independence on the board. And quite frankly, uh, given the um, now growing concerns of uh, financial malfeasance, I think the, the CFO has to go and, and um, you know, if they can't clean this up, uh, there might be a, a need for a change at the top. Paul mentioned the stocks being that we've been seeing in it so far today, down over 30% on pace for its worst day since October of 2018. From a technical perspective, how much more pain do you think there is to run here? Well, the, the question is, is um, you know, uh, are the revenues real? I, I do think that, that the revenues are real. Um, I don't know how real the profitability may be, right? Uh, because there are multiple ways to uh, probably manipulate the numbers. Um, the one thing that, that we wrote is that um, you know the, the near-term deals are probably intact because it's really tough to uh, change switch uh, vendors uh, for for an AI deal, uh, but longer term there are going to be downs in terms of order activity uh, and working with Supermicro. So um, it's going to be the f- future outlook going forward uh, that 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 could be at risk and, and could drive the stock uh, going forward. All right, Wooj, thanks so much for joining us. Wu Jin Ho, he's a senior technology analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. Uh, he's based down there in our Princeton uh, office. Again, the stock off 30% today. SMCI is the ticker. Despite that, it's still up about 20% on the year. Yeah. It's got a market cap right now, just about $20 billion. But again, this thing back in March, 
of this year was $180. Right. It had been the best performing stock in the S&P 500 at one point uh, for the year, even outpacing NVIDIA's earnings. But then once you see these big declines, obviously not anymore. And Wu Jin saying that this is the second auditor they've mm. had in 18 months, I, I think tells you all you need to know here. It's just, it kind of goes to a credibility of their reported financial results. And if, as an investor, if you don't feel comfortable with you know, the financial results, yeah, it's tough to put a valuation on that. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing today. We're seeing that move, uh, again, a 70%, 70% move off of that uh, March uh, high. So again, the market kind of voting with its feet. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. We had some of the big uh, European banks uh, started reporting. UBS uh, came out with some better than expected numbers, but management, I think, you know, they're saying, hey, there's some risks out there. So kind of tempering the outlook a little bit. So let's break it down with Allison Williams. Uh, she is uh, the senior banks analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. So Allison, I mean, uh, you know, of the big European banks, UBS is the one I think a lot of people focus on because they have such a big presence here in, in the U.S. What did you see coming out of UBS and kind of what's their outlook? So a really strong quarter. Fundamentals look good. I think there are some concerns about capital. Um, and that might be weighing on the shares today. But, you know, to your point, people look at their business, 60% growth in their America's wow. uh, trading business. So, I, so wow is the word. Yep. It was a record uh, trading, record third quarter trading for them. Keep in mind that third quarter tends to be weak. So, um, but it was, the, it was the, the strongest third quarter they've ever had. And that was really due to cash equities and derivatives. Um, strengths of the bank. So 27% growth really uh, looking good and a lot of momentum coming into the fourth quarter. The other positive for UBS, you know, the, that core wealth franchise is really uh, what sets them apart. And they did have very strong uh, flows, uh, inflows across all the regions, especially Asia. So that's also very good. And then on the deal execution side, we also like what we're seeing there in terms of the cost project you know, the gro gross cost saves are over 50% uh, the way there. So that's a positive, the non-core unit. So that's, you know, stuff they want to get rid of. Uh, they're making cuts there faster than expected. But uh, capital, as I said, that was the one thing I think, you know, investors are still a little bit skittish on. They did uh, actually uh, take a, a cut to their capital ratio in the quarter, basically because they voluntarily are kind of giving up some accounting relief. So, you know, I think that that's, you know, that's uh, accounting is, is sort of just noise in my view. Um, but they did say that, you know, they're not sure if when they report the fourth quarter in February, if they're going to be able to give guidance on buybacks. And that's because, you know, wh while they're executing on this deal fundamentally, uh, regulators, you know, are concerned about the size and they may force them to hold more capital. Looking over at UBS's stock right now, down about 3.6% on pace for its worst day since August 2nd. Of course, you were talking about obviously capital, but there was also a lack of any further guidance from executives on that analyst call as well. So how much is that also weighing on the stock at this point, Allison? Well, I think it really is the lack of guidance on capital to your point that it, that is weighing because you know, and they basically they restarted their buyback, um, you know, in, in the first half. But people are very focused on the prospects for capital return. And I think the fact that, you know, not only did they not give guidance, but they said they might not be able to give guidance in February is the concern. So how representative is UBS, UBS of kind of some of the other European banks, uh, Allison? So it's interesting that, um, you know, UBS versus the other banks, they are more skewed to the equities business. Um, they do have a very strong U.S. presence, as you said. They also tend to be strong in Asia, and we really saw a lot of strength there late quarter that benefited, uh, you know, the companies such as J.P. Morgan and Morgan Stanley. So um, Deutsche Bank does not have the equities business, but they were very strong in FIC. And we'll see what happens with, um, you know, BNP and Stockton are the next ones uh, to come. So they might not get that same lift uh, that UBS saw from their kind of unique footprint, 
But generally, we did hear about strength across regions, across cash and derivatives, and derivatives is a, a strength for those two French banks. And so we think that we could see some strength there tomorrow. All right, Allison, thank you so much uh, for joining us. As always, Allison Williams, she's a senior banks analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence uh, globally. Uh, full disclosure, I am a client of UBS. A shout out to Tony O.C. and the boys. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business App. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Again, looking at that Eli Lilly story, the stock's down 5%, so it's well off its intraday lows. It was off about 11 or 12% earlier. But guess what? It's up 47% year to date. So this one's had a nice run. It's got an $800 billion market cap, but clearly a little bit of a miss here today. Let's break it down with somebody who knows Eli Lilly better than anybody out there. That's Sam Fazzelli, Director of Research for Global Industries and a Senior Pharmaceuticals Analyst, the go-to voice in the city of London. If you want to talk about this healthcare stuff and if you want to talk wine, he's also probably <laughs> better adept at that. So, Sam, uh, Eli Lilly, I know you you know this company really well. What did they disclose today in the results and why is the stock selling off? Yeah, so hi, Paul. Nice to see you all again. Um, I'm looking at the um, screen. You know, as as you guys said earlier, it had been down like 13 and a half, 14, 15 percent, and now it's kind of coming back. The call is just finished, the Q3 call, and I'll just break it down quickly for you. When they reported, we got a miss, right? And I'm looking at it right now. They missed by six percent on revenue. That is not. What do you do when you're a 60 PE company, right? <laughs> it just, it doesn't, it, 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 the world's not forgiving enough on that. And by the way, those burritos you're talking about, 785 calories for an average burrito. Wow. So <laughs> if you want to help Eli Lilly, you have three of those a day. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no. So, so just, uh, just breaking that down further, this was two drugs, Monjaro and, and Zepbound. And those are the drugs that everybody talks about. This is the, um, the uh, obesity uh, drugs that are on the market. They missed. Why did they miss? The company said that it's because there was an inventory destocking going on at some wholesalers. So people go, wait a minute. You're saying to me that demand is cannot be satisfied. Supply, we're supply limited. So why is there an inventory issue in the middle here? And of course, that's what led to the question of, oh my God, are we overestimating demand here? Is the company overestimating demand? Is the world overestimating demand? So why have we come back from 5%? Simple answer. It sounds like with the 12 different forms of the drug that they have, that no one in this early launch phase, we can call it early launch, right? Given that it's been a couple of years, is really able to manage and work out what they need to have as inventory, because in such a massive product, you're going to have an impact on working capital, even for the wholesalers. It sounds like that that's the issue, that even Lily themselves can't necessarily forecast here, right? I mean, the actual details of how much of each product they have to make. If that's true, then, and I think you get a little whiff of that in the fact that foliar guidance wasn't dropped by as much as the miss, um, that at least currently they are optimistic about picking a whole bunch of that back up in the Q4, that we should not worry about demand. You talk to any doctor you want. Do they say, oh, I have no patients left to ask me for uh, right. Zep bound or Wigovi or whatever. So I think that's what's happening here. Uh, the difficulty in managing and thinking about how to manage your inventory. Something I wanted to pick your brain about was when it comes to knockoffs, because we saw a huge drop yeah. in hims and hers uh, earlier this month. So they were so they previously were allowed to manufacture copycat drugs uh, when they're deemed in short supply by the FDA. But the yeah. FDA at that time said when it came to Zepbound and Monjaro, specifically for Eli Lilly, they weren't shortage anymore. So that's why you saw that drop there. But they still, when it came to Ozempic and Wagovi, when you think about Novo Nordisk, they were still able to offer compounded verg um, actually versions of those. So I'm wondering when you think about Eli Lilly versus what's happening with Novo Nordisk, how does that kind of come into play when you're thinking about when it comes to sort of the knockoffs and the copycat type drugs? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I'm not even sure that people have stopped making compounded versions of Zepbound and Monjaro. 
because the FDA kind of reeled back a little bit and said, oh, we're going to actually look at this again. So I don't think that story is finished. I think that these folks are, some folks are still able to supply those from a compounded ph pharmacy perspective. So, um, you know, that is, that's, that's a law, that's a, a, a route that the FDA does provide to people. If there's a shortage of a drug and someone else can make it, well, let them do it. Uh, the interesting angle, of course, is that a whole bunch of people who are taking off the compounded pharmacists are probably paying less and therefore, if they're forced to go and take it from a prescription, they may have to pay more out of pocket. So that's not going to be a, leaving a particularly good taste in, in folks' mouths once that this um, actually happens. But it hasn't happened yet. So, And they did say on the call that this is not because there's enormous demand being fulfilled by compounded pharmacies. It's, it's literally to do with that inventory management issue. Where... What are the companies saying, Sam, about getting this in an oral format? I think that might be one of no. the, the next big, I guess, mileposts for this type of treatment. Yeah, I remember, Paul, there's already an oral form of this. It's called Rebelsis. It's from Novo Nordisk. It's just a tough drug to use because you have to have it within about half an hour of eating. You can't take it too close or too far from an eating because you need a, a, an empty stomach before you take the drug. And it's a big dose, and maybe the side effect profile isn't as great, and the weight loss isn't as great. So people are trying to develop oral versions of these drugs, but also oral drugs that are like normal drugs, small molecules that they can swallow as a pill once a day. So that's coming. So what do you think shareholders need to watch for next when it comes to, especially after its outlook disappointed? I think we need to see how Q4 does. So let's let's hope that that their their current guidance at least they meet it, maybe beat it. That would be nice. Um, the issue is then we move into well Q4. There's an interesting result from a clinical trial that's coming up. They've done this before. They're comparing Zepbound with Wigovi, and I suspect that they're hoping and that that data suggests that they might they will show that it has better. Uh, weight loss. Whether the side effect profile would be better or different, time will tell. But that's there. Are, not many pharma companies do these type of, <clears throat> excuse me, head-to-head -head trials because that takes some. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No. I just, I just wanted to get real quick. What's the, uh, the yeah. latest thinking on the size of this market? I know you guys have done a lot of work on this. Oh uh, yeah. I think I think Mikey's latest numbers are at ninety-three billion. Wow. Um, I I don't <laughs> remember exactly. Okay. It's big. Yeah. Well, out of nothing exactly. So. Right. Oh, before so, you but go. then twenty twenty-five, we have a whole load of data coming. Yes. Is there any significant evidence that red wine is healthy for you? <laughs> oh, I'm not going to go there because I'm Oops. a dry health drug analyst, not a red wine analyst. I just know that I enjoy a glass or two. <laughs> you got You got to have to remember it's also bad for you causes cancer, all sorts oh, of things. No, so, it's oh, fine. Please. Oh, it's fine. It's, and he lives in, <laughs> Look, lives in Bordeaux. We, we have to be, no, a whole bunch of people listen to this. This is, this, is not, this is not about a bottle of wine a day, maybe a glass. But even then, I think the medical professional says, be careful. But I choose to take that risk. <laughs> and I do uh, <laughs> love it. You're so brave. <laughs> Sam Fazzelli, thank you so much for that. Sam Fazzelli, he's a director of research. Uh, he also covers the pharmaceutical industry for Bloomberg Intelligence over in London. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Uh, we're right smack in the middle of earnings season. This is the busiest week of the quarter uh, in terms of companies and market cap reporting. A uh, big one last night, uh, our friends at uh, Google. That's right. Um, over 30% of the market cap for the S&P 500 is that reporting this week. This week okay. Right. Excellent. Yeah, busiest so week big, for earnings week. season. Um, good quarter, I guess, across the board. Mandeep Singh joins us. Uh, he's a senior technology analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. Um, Mandeep, everybody knows Google. They know the search story. What did you learn last night from uh, Google and their results? That, you know, uh, search, cloud, YouTube, these are three separate businesses uh, doing extremely well at scale. I mean, double digit growth for search business is uh, really stellar when you think of all the pressure they've been facing, you know, when it comes to new entrants like ChatGPT and uh, perplexity and whatnot. And everyone uh, is of the belief that they would take at least some share from mm -hmm. Google, at least in, in in terms of ad revenue, Google hasn't lost any share. In fact, uh, it's it's a very healthy growth uh, at their scale. And 
YouTube, look, 50 billion plus revenue run rate, wow. 70, 30 split between subscriptions. Uh, ads uh, is 70 and 30% is subscriptions. And it's subscriptions nice grew, you know, 28%. I mean, just think about mm -hmm. uh, $15 billion subscriptions business growing 28%. That's very impressive. So, and we're not even talking about Waymo here. So okay. when you look at you know all the businesses, they clearly have a lot going on, and uh, Waymo is a future bet, but something that could be huge in in, in terms of you know top line. You know what's interesting? You just mentioned fifty billion of run rate revenue for, yeah. for YouTube and advertising subscription. That sounds a lot like a, the cable television business, yeah, the cable, the cable right. network business. I look at yeah. uh, Paramount, Paramount Global. You know all those cable networks, they have thirty billion of revenue. Oof. So. YouTube is significantly yeah. bigger than some of the largest advertising and subscription driven media companies out there yeah. in a dozen years. It's just extraordinary. And Mandeep, you were talking about these massive investments that Google uh, and Alphabet, obviously the parent company, has been trying to catch up to the likes of obviously Microsoft will get another update from their earnings after the bell and, and of course OpenAI. Walk us through some of those investments and how they're starting to pay off. I mean, uh, look, in the case of Alphabet, they have huge data center investments simply because uh, they have a giant infrastructure that's powering, you know, these uh, big businesses. Uh, so there's a lot of internal consumption of uh, these chips, but also the cloud business, which saw a nice acceleration, you know, sequential acceleration from 29% growth to 35% growth. I would say a lot of that uh, is driven by the availability of GPUs in their cloud. So I would be interested in seeing how much of Microsoft GPUs are being used for internal consumption versus what is being exposed on their Azure cloud. Because in my mind, Google having their own chips is making a difference in terms of their cloud growth, and that's why you saw that acceleration. But I'll have to validate that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> how, how is AI impacting John Tucker, Jess Men's search results. Right. <laughs> I mean, just the nature of search is changing in the sense you can ask, uh, you know, a lot longer uh, queries. The prompts can be infinite in length. You can, uh, you know, have a video or an image prompt. It, it just doesn't have to be text. So that's what uh, Google called out, that the queries are getting a lot more complex in nature mm -hmm. and users are actually engaging with it. So it's not as if, you know, that's driving them to some other platform. Users want to use what they call multimodal uh, search, which is a combination of text, videos and images and, and audios. So that's why these LLMs are so powerful because they give you that innate capability to search in whatever format you want and you can just throw it in, in that search box. So that search box is getting a lot bigger mm. and a lot more complex uh, on that Google page. So what do we need to watch for with Microsoft today? I mean, Azure growth. I said, uh, you know, the availability of GPUs is what uh, is powering Google Cloud's acceleration. I want to see that acceleration in Microsoft's Azure growth to uh, confirm that Microsoft is not losing share to Google, or for that matter, Amazon, which reports on Thursday. And tomorrow on surveillance, tomorrow morning, we're gonna have Dan Ives in studio oh, okay. from Wedbush Security, so he'll be doing presumably a victory lap for Why Microsoft. can't man deep dress like Dan Ives? Oh, right, I was about to bring <laughs> up the, uh, what kind of bright colors Dan well, might be wearing tomorrow. Man deep, because it takes an <laughs> effort here. He matches his turban, man deep's a sink for those that on radio can't see, he matches his turban with the suit every oh, day. Oh, every day. sharp. <laughs> so that is solid. I give him credit okay. for that. I mean, I mean, anybody walking here with like a, 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 Who knew? a pink tie and everything. We, uh, we all know how Paul Sweeney's the uh, the fashion police here. So Paul know. Fashion Police Sweeney <laughs> of uh, Bloomberg <laughs> News. There is a dress code that I enforced at Bloomberg and Kelly. <laughs> Those summer Fridays, I remember, I think someone came in Paul with flip-flops and he, they had a stern all, warning from Paul about that. Can we all agree no flip-flops in the workplace? <laughs> My, John Tucker, you, you, you're with all me. All right, I'll go along. Although I do have like, you know, well, he's my got the casual duck sliders. <laughs> duck sliders on. That's how as, as casual as Tucker gets. Mandeep, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Mandeep Singh, he covers all the technology. He manages all of our technology coverage great globally stuff. for Bloomberg Intelligence. And obviously, technology is a, a global business. Uh, Asia is such an important part of the uh, technology stories in terms of not only an end market, but a source for a lot of that technology and manufacturing. Um, and we've got a big team out in Asia for Bloomberg Intelligence. And Mandeep manages all that for us. So he's our go to person. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. 
Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Let's stick with the topic of politics. Uh, why not? Because we got the election coming up on Tuesday. Um, here's an interesting uh, headline in the Bloomberg Terminal. How Puerto Rico became an issue in the U.S. election. Laura Davison joins us. She's a political editor for Bloomberg News. Uh, she's down in D.C. So, Laura, we've heard a lot about Puerto Rico in this election just in the last week or so. Can you explain to us kind of what's going on, why it may be important? Yeah, so this really kicked off um, over the weekend at Trump's rally at Madison Square Garden, where a comedian who was one of the uh, um, uh, kind of preview speakers before Trump came onto the stage uh, made a joke about Puerto Rico where he called it a floating island of garbage. Um, and that has really picked up a lot of traction. Um, you know, it was sort of uh, – in the mix of all a bunch of other incendiary and racist comments at this rally, um, but also because Puerto Ricans are a particularly important voting bloc, in, especially in Pennsylvania, um, and sort of you know uh, not that directly connected to this, but it also has been a group that uh, both Trump and Harris have had um, outreach to in recent days. The day that that remark was made, Harris was at a Puerto Rican restaurant in Pennsylvania. Trump just last night was in Allentown, Pennsylvania, which has a large Latino population, um, and Pennsylvania, yet the whole, has one of the largest Puerto Rican populations um, in the country. So this was quickly uh, uh, denounced by um, several people, um, you know, uh, Puerto Ricans, but also, um, you know, Republicans uh, that represent Florida, Senator Rick Scott, for example. Even the Trump campaign came out and said, look, uh, you know, we uh, didn't approve this. We don't, uh, you know, support this doesn't represent our views, which is not something you see a lot from the Trump campaign. I wanted to get your thoughts on the latest headlines that we had in the past hour about the Supreme Court allowing Virginia to purge voters before the election. Walk us through what we know so far on this and what's the precedence for something like this? Yeah, so um, at issue are about 1,600 voters um, in, on the Virginia rolls, um, which the uh, state has asked uh, to uh, purge. They say, look, we think that these um, are not citizens um, on here and we want to remove them. Um, there are laws in place about, you know, how close to an election you can um, get rid of some of these. Uh, you know, you can change uh, the voter rolls. Um, so they petitioned the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court uh, today said, yes, um, you can go ahead and remove these people from the voter rolls. Um, you know, this is not, um, you know, Virginia is not expected to be a swing state here or be a decisive in the uh, election. 1,600 is a relatively small number, but this has a lot of um, election security people worried that this, this could foretell some larger purge um, in, a, in a state that could potentially be decisive in um, either the presidential race or, uh, you know, any of the um, uh, contested Senate races. Yeah, I, I have to admit, I haven't, I can't recall seeing a story like this where this has actually occurred. Does this happen with any regularity across the country or is this case in Virginia particularly unique? This is um, a sort of a unique thing we're seeing. Um, you know, this is something that, um, you know, has come up um, in several states, um, you know, both, uh, you know, we've seen uh, in Nebraska, for example, they wanted to change their rules about how they um, apportion their electoral college votes. You've seen some other states some having some some issues about this. But generally, um, you know, either for political reasons or for legal reasons, they uh, states have said, no, we can't change things as close to elections. So this was a little bit of a surprise um, this morning from the Supreme Court. So when you look at the kind of latest headlines coming through the terminal, uh, Virginia canceled registrations of estimated 1,600 residents here. Of course, uh, Donald Trump and Kamala Harris was, will crisscross several string states today, passing each other, of course, in Wisconsin. Uh, when we have less than a week to go ahead of Election Day, what do you think is most crucial here when they're pushing through what their potential policy proposals are? Yeah, so the, what they're um, doing now is they have generally put out all the policy proposals they have, but you still have seen Trump uh, start to outline some additional ones as he's been um, sort of grasping for uh, for additional votes. Um, but they're really um, framing and honing in on their argument, uh, you know, of why voters should vote for them. So we saw last night with Harris on the ellipse, um, she was making an argument um, about Trump being a danger, but you also saw her quickly pivot to talk about, you know, sort of her uh, prescriptive view, particularly for the economy. Uh, we know that that has been one of the key issues for voters, um, really the top issue in this election. You've seen Trump really double down on immigration. Uh, you know, polls show that this is, you know, perhaps probably the number two issue in this race. Um, but, uh, you know, even more so uh, than talking about the economy, he's really been doubling down on immigration, uh, the threat of migrants. And that's sort of why uh, this uh, Puerto Rican comment from over the weekend has really caught fire. Down in Washington, D.C., Laura, what's the feeling about some of the down ballot uh, races that are key to the control of both the House and the Senate? 
Yeah, so um, there really uh, is a key overlap between some of these key Senate races um, as well as, the, as sort of the battleground states. So, you know, we're looking at places like Pennsylvania and Michigan and Arizona. Um, Democrats um, are at a disadvantage when it comes to the Senate. They are defending a bunch of seats, um, you know, in, in places uh, like Ohio and Montana um, that Trump has won and are expected to win um, uh, in a couple in, in next week. Um, the House is a little bit more of a wild card, and um, because those races uh, aren't really overlapping with the Electoral College map, it's really uh, New York area, particularly the New York City suburbs, as well as California, sort of the Southern California suburbs around San Diego and Los Angeles that will be decisive there. Um, so that's a really close race. It's really anyone's guess as to you know which way the House flips. Uh, the Senate, uh, you know, Republicans have an, have an advantage, uh, but you know there things could all break uh, in Democrats' way if they you know hit every race just right. Of course, there's a lot of discussion that we potentially might not even know the results of the election that evening, kind of similar to what we would have seen in 2020. Uh, we didn't get the final results till that following weekend on that Saturday. What's kind of when your conversations with your sources are they saying as far as what the timetable could be potentially of when we would know the eventual results here? Yeah, it's looking like this. We will not have results on election night. It is possible, but a, a relatively remote possibility. Um, there are several states, um, including Pennsylvania, that will likely end up being decisive um, that take um, a little bit longer than average to vote. Um, you know, this each state has different rules about when they can start voting, particularly when they can start mail-in ballots, when they can start um, tabulating early votes and sort of all the different things they need to do um, to come to an official total. Um, so that really varies state by state. And of course, we also anticipate that there might be legal challenges that could either pause the counting or stop the counting or, you know, take time to, for things to work through the courts. Um, so uh, it's it's very likely that this will be days, if potentially weeks, um, if there are, uh, you know, several hurdles in key states um, and it looks to be, you know, really tight margins. All right, Laura, thank you so much for joining us. Laura Davison, she's a political editor for Bloomberg News, <clears throat> joining us from Washington, D.C. So again, I think that's going to be really interesting, Jessica, and probably very frustrating for a lot of people who you know, want to go to bed on election night like we used to, <laughs> knowing kind of who the uh, president is going to be, but it could be. Right, could take uh, days again. Yeah, and maybe perhaps even longer, and I don't know, you know, I guess that simply just reflects the fact that the electorate is so evenly divided. That right, literally every college. vote counts. Mm -hmm. You can't be there at 8 o'clock p.m. and call the race. You know, right. A, a, I guess a network news anchor. Those days are over. Right. No, definitely. So it'll be interesting to see how things play out over the next week. This is the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live each weekday, 10 a.m. to noon Eastern, on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, tune in, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.